Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Randy Harwood. Randy is a retired dentist. He had a private practice in the South Bay and was a clinical instructor at UCLA. Presently, when not traveling the world or giving presentations to other organizations, he spends a lot of his time walking Ew. throughout the peninsula or his backyard with his camera tracking the wildlife. Wait till you see his pictures. Randy is also a board member of the PV Land Conservancy. He chairs the stewardship committee and conducts virtual nature walks for them. We're going to get some of that nature walk today. I present Randy. Yes, good afternoon. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. This started out as a right, baby. Let me go. Um, hearing somebody. Yeah, I just started... muted him. Okay, thanks. This started out as a, as a uh, training thing for the nature walk leaders in the land conservancy. I was asked to give it. And it's a look at a lot of the animals that if you're out in Palos Verdes, whether you're in your, your own yard, in a park, down the street, or hopefully walking the trails of the land conservancy, or maybe along the coast, you're likely to see some animals. And this is a kind of a, a preview or a survey of many of the animals you could possibly see. And I'm gonna say a little bit about what they are, at least their name or something. I suspect that a lot of you know all of this. And so um, to that extent, um, take it as a, just a celebration of the great biodiversity that we are so lucky to enjoy uh, here in Palos Verdes. Uh, as you probably know, uh, California is a biodiversity hotspot. We have a huge number of different kinds of uh, animals and plants, much more so than a lot of other places in America. It's a very special place. And so this is a little bit of a celebration of those, of those animals. Um, and again, I'm happy to take uh, comments, criticisms, uh, questions, whatever you want, okay? So uh, my title slide's got this big butterfly that's probably the most famous butterfly in North America. It's a monarch butterfly. And, um, uh, hello. Okay, that's, sorry about this. Oh, whew. And um, as you know, these monarchs are, are having some trouble finding uh, roosting down in Mexico where they migrate to, but I'm still seeing monarchs here in uh, Palos Verdes. They're really beautiful. We've got a bunch of swallowtail butterflies in Palos Verdes, uh, three particularly. This is the Western tiger swallowtail, and this is the giant swallowtail. And this one is the anise swallowtail. They all look pretty similar. You gotta really kind of look at all the different markings to distinguish the three, but they're all these big yellow and black butterflies are usually swallowtails. We've got a monarch, uh, excuse me, a, a morning cloak butterfly that's very common. I was just seeing one outside of my window right now. These are really beautiful little butterflies that are very aggressive. If you uh, get into their territory, they might even, they'll try to push you off their territory. I've had them actually land on me occasionally. This is one of the more um, aggressive butterflies. They'll chase birds chase cats, all kinds of things. This is what a lot of butterflies uh, show, the difference between the upper wing and the lower wings. This is the same butterfly um, with uh, much less color. There's the upper wing and the, and the lower wing. This is our red admiral. It's a little bit smaller one, real pretty uh, uh, butterfly common in Palos Verdes. This guy is the painted lady. And you may remember we had a, a big migration of these a little while ago thousands and thousands of them migrating from Mexico, I think, up through uh, the coast going north. That's the Painted Lady. This is a, a real pretty little one, not seen quite as often, called the Sarah Orange Tip, a little pretty little one. And then we have these little white butterflies that flutter around in the wild radish and stuff. This is the um, Cabbage White. And there's another white called the Checkered White. We have a similar butterfly, only it's yellow orange. It's the orange sulfur. Uh, any questions? I was asked to stop every once in a while. Anybody have a comment? Okay. So there's all these little things that I used to think were moths. They're, they're real small. They're often in the, the wildflowers and stuff. They're called skippers. And they're kind of like a, a halfway between a moth and a butterfly. Um, moths typically have a real furry body and, 
and have these real furry antennae uh, and they hold their wings back like that. But butterflies have um, uh, these uh, different kind of antennae, just like these skippers. And so this is called a fiery skipper. This one is called a checkered skipper. And this one's the umber skipper. And these are only three of probably six or eight different skippers that we have here in Palos Verdes. This is another one that I've only seen a few times. I saw, I saw this, I got this photo at Ocean Trails. This is a funereal dusky wing, another kind of skipper. <clears throat> this, and this one's a gray hair streak. And so you can see all of a sudden here, just in Palos Verdes, where I'm just naming off butterfly after butterfly, all these different butterflies. If you go to a lot of places, they're lucky to get two species of butterflies. Uh, this one here is called the um, Akmon Blue. This is now we're getting into our blues. And this one is the Marine Blue. Palos Verdes is famous for its blue butterflies. There's the, I don't have good photos, so that's why I'm not showing them to you, the El Segundo Blue, which is a very un, a rare bird, a rare butterfly. And then, uh, of course, the, the famous Palos Verdes or PV Blue Butterfly, which is considered possibly the rarest butterfly in the world. Uh, the Land Conservancy is making a big effort to create habitat for both the El Segundo and the PV blue butterflies, hoping that they can come back. Right now in February is the time that the PV blue butterfly usually breaks out and starts flying around and mating. And so I'm hoping to see some actual wild PV blue butterflies this spring. Actually, in two days, I'm gonna go look for them again at Chandler. Um, these butterflies, all these blues are about as big as your thumbnail. So without a really close look, it's very hard to ID them. But all these little tiny kind of bluish colored butterflies are all variations of a, the, the family of butterflies called blues. Any questions? So we've got some larger uh, in, invasive, I guess they call them. They're not native butterflies that are very common now. This is called the Gulf fritillary butterfly. It's a real pretty butterfly. You can see the, uh, for the upper wings and then the, and the, the bottom wings on these actually are a lot prettier. They're having these big metallic panels. These two are mating. They, if you have passion flower vine in your yard, you probably have gulf fritillaries. They require, they, this, that's why they're here because of the passion flower vine. And uh, uh, they are actually really pretty, but they're not native. My wife and I were asked to participate in a butterfly count for Palos Verdes a few months ago. And we went to Madrona Marsh and did that. Uh, and then we came back home and said, well, shoot, let's look, at, look for butterflies in our yard and do the count for, for our yard as well. And we actually found this butterfly in our yard on the day of the PV butterfly count. This is a zebra long wing. It's not supposed to be here. And the guy that did the, uh, organized the whole count said it's the first possibly the first recording of this butterfly in California. There's a questionable account of one of them in 1939. So we were pretty lucky on the day of the butterfly count to come up with this beautiful zebra long wing. So you wanna always keep your eyes open. You never know what you're gonna see. I don't know if this represents a species that's going to become common like the uh, Gulf fritillary or not, but um, I, I do welcome it in my yard in the fact that it's so beautiful. Then, of course, we move on to a different group of animals, insects called the dragonflies. Uh, there's a bunch of different ones. I love dragonflies because they're so beautiful. They're so aerial, aerial, aerial acrobatic and they eat mosquitoes, which is a good thing. This is a blue dasher. And this is the flame skimmer. And of course, there's, you know, there's all kinds of cool things about dragonflies, but we don't have the time to go over all of it, but they are another real valuable uh, animal in Palos Verdes. Similar to dragonflies are damselflies, and uh, they're much smaller. They hold their wings back over their body. This is a vivid damselfly. <clears throat> and then of course, we've got all of our bees. And uh, I'm just gonna have, show you a couple. We have a, a different bumblebees. This one I think is a Sonoran, but I'm not positive. You can see it's getting pollen off of that rock purslane flower. But my favorite bee that we have is the valley carpenter bee. It's 
a big one. Usually you're going to see the females, which are all black. So if you see a big, slow flying black bee, it's probably a valet carpenter bee. They're real mellow. They're not aggressive. The males, uh, you see very much more females than the males. When you see the, the male, you're, I think you're lucky. This is a, a male, the big orangey. They look like big teddy bears, the valley carpenter bee. On to the amphibians. So uh, there aren't that many amphibians that we usually see in Talos Verdes, but there are a couple. If it's really raining a lot, especially in December, if you see earthworms on the ground, be careful and take a close look because some of your earthworms may have eyes and a mouth and legs. It's a salamander called a black-bellied slender salamander. Uh, my wife and I have found a few of them every year since we've been here in Palos Verdes, which is about 18 years, usually around Christmas in the rain. Little time, they look just like an earthworm in the, unless you look real closely. Black-bellied slender salamander. And then the other one that you may get lucky to see, they're very, very tiny, are the Pacific chorus frogs. I used to call them all tree frogs. Um, they're real, real small. Again, they're maybe as big as a thumbnail, um, but they've got a big voice and they're real, real pretty. Pacific chorus frog. <clears throat> so that's it for amphibians, uh, except for this guy, which is a very destructive, very invasive, not, it's too bad it's here critter. This is a bullfrog. Um, this is a bullfrog that recently was a tadpole. You can see he's still got his tail. But these are very destructive to uh, not only the native amphibians, but also the fish. They're really hard on our native trout. They're really hard on birds. They're really hard on uh, reptiles. They're, they pretty much are, whatever they can get their mouth around, they'll eat. And they displace a lot of our native uh, uh, animals, bullfrogs. <clears throat> On to reptiles. So Palos Verdes does have a rattlesnake, as you know, the Western Pacific rattlesnake. I took this picture in Filiorum. It was maybe a six or eight inches off the trail on a real narrow trail with a lot of brush. So uh, I, this is my point to uh, always remind everybody when they're out on the trails to pay attention to where they're walking and to please stay on the trails because these guys can be, uh, be there and they are there occasionally, especially if we have a lot of rain get a lot of grass, which gets, gets us a lot of rodents, then we'll have an upswing in the numbers of snakes as well. But it's a very valuable snake for the environment. They control the rodents. Um, this is a snake that's confused with rattlesnakes a lot. This is not my picture. This is me with a gopher snake. I was asked to uh, rescue a couple of gopher snakes in a friend's yard that had been trapped in a netting that they had around their tree. And they didn't feel like they wanted to wrestle with snakes, so they called me. And um, I was happy to, to do that. And uh, they're beautiful snakes. They're extremely valuable to our environment. And, then, and until humans came around, they were uh, protected by, by mimicking rattlesnakes. They'll coil up, they'll open up their jaws and have a big head, and they'll rattle their tail in the dry brush to make predators that normally would avoid a rattlesnake also avoid them. Unfortunately, well, with humans, they are now greatly persecuted as uh, people think they're rattlesnakes. They are very valuable, they're harmless constrictors that eat, guess what, gophers and other mice and rats. So I was happy to take them and I dropped them in my yard and I'm hoping that they're doing their job and eating the gophers. Um, they, they are very, um, very good at controlling small rodents. Any questions, comments? No? Okay, so another snake uh, is the California king snake. This is a, a very widely distributed snake in California. It's really beautiful. They have, uh, the, they eat a lot of stuff too, including rattlesnakes. They are uh, potentially, they have uh, the potential of, of avoiding the venomous uh, effects if they're bit by rattlesnake and often will, will actually uh, kill and eat rattlesnakes as well as other animals, lizards, birds and stuff, very common. Um, I saw this on Burma Road, just past the Del Cerro Gate at about eight o'clock in the morning when, one time when I was on a hike. I'm sure you've all seen these guys. This is probably the most commonly seen lizard. Uh, it's the Western fence lizard. A lot of people call them blue bellies for obvious reasons. They are also really important for the environment. 
and they're the ones that do the push-ups when they're showing you how big and strong they are. Um, they actually are helpful in controlling um, the ticks out in the preserves. So they're, they're, and they eat other insects. They're, they're a valuable lizard. This one's similar, it's a common side blotch lizard. Uh, we don't see them quite as often, but I see them right in front of the interpretive center, actually, along the fence post where you're marking with numbers how to ID the whales. If you look at the little lizards running there, a lot of times it's this guy, the common side blotch lizard. I also see them up at Chandler. <clears throat> this is actually apparently, according to uh, the herpetologist at the Natural History Museum, the most common lizard we have here in Palos Verdes. It's the alligator lizard. But we don't see it nearly as often as the fence lizard because it's much more secretive. It's under brush and things like that. Um, but it's, a, it's much more widely distributed. Apparently, there's more of them. And they're, um, they're also a harmless lizard, but they do a lot of good in that they eat a lot of insects that you may not want in your yard. I don't know if you've heard about this guy. This is the Italian wall lizard. It's a in, highly invasive lizard brought from Italy by an Italian from Sicily who thought it would be a good idea to bring three males and two or three females from Sicily to his new home in San Pedro. And he set up a, his backyard to make sure that they wouldn't get out and that they would survive. But unfortunately they did get out and they are basically overrunning San Pedro and they're heading towards uh, White Point right now. They are displacing our alligator lizards and our fence lizards. Um, um, they're actually pretty, this is an adult male and it's, they're real, real pretty, but they are a, a highly invasive problem that's a fairly new problem. So now we're going to go for the group of, of animals that you're more, most likely to see every day when you go out and that's birds. Um, and so uh, there's going to be a lot of pictures of birds. I'm going to just quickly go through uh, most of the birds you're likely to see in Palos Verdes. Uh, so again, I suspect a lot of you know all this stuff. So just in, hopefully in, enjoy the fact that we have so many different kinds of birds here in California. So this is uh, Alan's hummingbird. And this is another uh, Alan's hummingbird dis displaying his tongue. So usually if you have a green back hummingbird with some rufous uh, reddish brown on it in Palos Verdes, it's probably the Allens. The other one that's really common is the Annas. And the Annas is the all green hummingbird. <clears throat> Here's an Annas with a chick. And as you probably know, their nests are incredibly, an incredible engineering feat. They get spider web and leaf material and stuff and create this, this elastic nest. As the chick grows, the nest grows with the chick. It's pretty amazing. Hummingbirds are pretty amazing for many reasons. The only bird that can fly backwards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They got a lot of things that make it, I could talk for an hour on hummingbirds. <laughs> And of course, hummingbirds have this incredible gorget, this uh, neck coloring. Now, the feathers really aren't that color. It, it has to do with how the light refracts off them when they move their head. This is an ananas. This guy, I'm going to pretend and call it a rufous hummingbird, which is the other one that we might see. Um, it can be all rufous colored like this, or only you see it has green cap and a green back. But it, um, this might be an Allen's. I'm going to call it a Rufus just to let you know that there are Rufuses. I'm not sure about that. But uh, also the gorget on this um, display, I think, is worth, worth appreciating. It's a beautiful little hummingbird. And you can see it's on my fountain. We um, occasionally will get as many as a two dozen hummingbirds at our fountain at dawn. It's like they come from all over and have a little uh, convention. And then they take off to wherever they're going to go. Randy. Um, Yes. Uh -huh. Is it possible that the hummingbirds could interbreed? Yes, I'm, I, I would imagine it's possible. Um, I'm not an expert on that, on the hybridization. Um, one thing I'll say about IDing these guys, if, if you have a brown a rufous and green hummingbird and you're going, is that an Allens or is that a rufous? What, what we do, we call it a rufous Allens hummingbird because uh, sometimes you need to look at the tail feathers and uh, there's all these little things that an ornithologist would do with a specimen that it's very difficult to do um, 
uh, out in the field. But anyway, on the thing on the fountains, if you want to attract birds to your yard, uh, bird feeders are nice, of course, but water, running water is a killer because it'll get, you'll get all kinds of birds coming to your fountain, which we do. So in Palos Verdes, we also have some uh, very key endangered birds that the Conservancy is trying to provide habitat for. You're probably all aware of it, the California gnat catcher. This is the male. He's got a little insect in his bill. And um, uh, you know, as you can tell what a bird's gonna do as far as how they make their living a lot by their bill. So these little pincher bills are great for insects. The main way to ID a, a California gnat catcher from the more, much, much more common blue-gray gnat catcher is the tail. Under the tail, if the undertail feathers are mostly black, it's the California. And the males do have this black cap. So here's the male and here's the female, just a little gray bird, gray brown bird, but she's also got that undertail that's all black. And um, the other way to ID a California by its call, California gnat catchers sound like a little kitten mewing in the sagebrush. Uh, they kind of uh, have this little mew sound that's very characteristic of California gnat catchers. Pretty endangered bird. We're providing that coastal sage scrub habitat for them. They have to have that. They can't live without it. And so we do have some success with the California gnat catchers. This is the other one. This is the one you see the most often. It's uh, maybe the prettier one. It's the blue gray gnat catcher. They're very active. They're not very shy. They often will be right around you if you kind of are quiet and hold still. And uh, again, if you check that undertail, mostly white. So that's our blue gray gnat catcher. Another real small group of birds are the bush tits. So if you see a flock of a dozen or two dozen or three dozen little brown jobs go into your tree and they singing real you know, lustily with their little bell-like sound, they're probably bush tits. And if you look closely at this picture, the one on the left, it's got a dark eye, that's the male. And the one on the right's got a light eye, that's the female. That's about the only way you can tell those two apart. Other than that, they're pretty, pretty uniform. Those are called bush tits. Another real little bird, very common. I've been watching one in my yard this morning. Is the ruby crowned kinglet. You can see why it's called a ruby crowned kinglet. But you're, if you see a hundred ruby crowned kinglets, you may see the red flash once or twice. It doesn't happen very often, but they, it happens the most during the breeding season. And I think they're starting to, maybe they're taking up, uh, figuring out who they're going to meet with and get rid of their adversaries and stuff because I've been seeing a lot of this red flashing going on lately. Another little bird that's got uh, that insect eating bill too is our house wren, very common bird. Uh, and we went to Wild Birds Unlimited and bought a house wren house. And it took about three years, but last year <clears throat> my house wrens in my yard decided to, to set up house. Here he is trying to figure out how to get that big stick in the hole. He ended up doing it. And we uh, were successful. We feel like we're grandparents. We had two clutches of two baby house wrens in our house wren house last year, which was pretty cool. Another wren we have is Buick's wren. It's B-E-W-I-C-K-S, Buick's wren. You can tell them if you look closely by that white line over the eye, the supercilium, and they have a very beautiful call. That's Buick's wren. And this wren, um, is found, you can find this along maybe Abalone Cove by the lifeguard tower. Walk along the beach, it, it'll be in the cobbles looking for insects like this one, he's got an earwig there. Um, so it's a rock wren along um, ocean trails, Abalone Cove, those places you can see rock wrens. But, we, but I have to talk the most about our um, coastal cactus wren, very threatened uh, bird of special concern. We have, um, been putting habitat in with the cactus, prickly pear cactus, which it has to have. It, it uh, is um, fairly, it's a very common bird in the desert, but our local coastal cactus wren is very threatened. I've been monitoring them for a couple of years for the conservancy, and I think I might have seen three individuals 
last year, and we've heard about maybe five or six throughout the, all of the 1400 acres. Um, one pair requires two to four acres of good cactus uh, habitat to survive and reproduce. They make Randy? This, yes. Uh -huh. Back to that other, pic, the, the previous picture, the you cactus wren. When he's vocalizing, right? Is That's he right. puffing his chest out? Yes, you see, he's puffing his chest, but also look at his throat. It's kind of puffed right. out as well. And thank you for, because for, this reminds me, if you'd like to know, if you're walking in Alta Vicente uh, and you look up slope and you see all this cactus and you hear what sounds like it's somebody's old 49 Ford with a dead battery and they're trying to start the car up, they go run, 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 that sound, that's our cactus ring. That's how we find them. Usually you, you'll hear them, which is true of a lot of birds, you'll hear them before you see them. So if you hear somebody trying to start an old car, in especially Alta Vicente, um, Filiorum, maybe Ocean Trails, I hope, uh, where there's lots of cactus, if you hear that sound, and, and if you're carrying binoculars, um, you've got to, you know, to appreciate birds and wildlife, it really is helpful to have binoculars, of course. Um, look for these guys and be a little patient because they'll end, end up doing this or pop up and because uh, if, they're, if they're doing that, they're either calling a mate or telling a male to get away or something like that. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, but they do make this big basket, woven, big woven basket nest. And they'll make a number of them. A lot of wrens do this. They'll make um, dummy uh, nests to fool predators because their nest is pretty um, vulnerable to snakes and birds, for instance. Um, and they do stick them in the middle of this cactus for a good reason. <clears throat> so onward to birds that you usually see flying overhead and you don't see on landing too much are the swallows. We have a, a number of different swallows. This is the northern rough wing swallow, just pretty much a brown bird. Uh, not a lot of color differentiation, but pretty common. Uh, this one's a prettier bird. It's called the barn swallow. You've got this reddish brown forehead and throat. And the barn swallow is the only swallow really that has a swallow tail, which is kind of weird, that long protruding swallow tail. That's our barn swallow. Um, this one is maybe my favorite, it's the tree swallow. The male is on the right, beautiful iridescent blue, and the female is on the left, that's a tree swallow. There's a lot of other swallows as well, but uh, we, we have a lot of different birds in PB. Then there's another whole group called flycatchers, and they, they do that, they catch flies. They, they'll sit on a perch, see a flying insect, go out and grab it, and often go right back to the same perch. They often flick their tails. Our most famous one, the most common one, you see them all over the place, these, this guy, the black Phoebe. And this is one less common, more of a migrant, is the Says Phoebe. Says Phoebe's got this kind of peachy uh, stomach, whereas the black Phoebe is black and white. We have an, uh, a Pacific slope flycatcher that comes in, is migrate, migrates in and out. Uh, and a larger flycatcher is called the ash throated flycatcher. We don't see these nearly as often. So when you're birding, if you see an ash throated flycatcher, it's, it's an exciting thing. We have bigger flycatchers. There's two kinds in Palos Verdes. They're called kingbirds. Um, this is Cassin's kingbird. And this is the Western kingbird. And they're very similar and kind of hard to tell apart. Supposedly the Cassin's head is darker than its neck and, and, the, and the kingbird is more of a uniform head color. Another one is that the kingbird has outer tail edges that are white like this. But either way, if you, if you see a big fly catching bird with a yellow breast, gray head, it's probably a kingbird. Oops, sorry. Uh, we, get a, we get Western meadowlarks, seen these in quite a few places. Um, White Point, Chandler, um, Madrona Marsh as well. And this was, I took this at Alta Vicente. So we do get our Western meadowlarks. They have a beautiful call. They used to be much, much, much more common because when, the, when there was a lot of open meadow and not as much development. Another whole group of birds are the vireos. And uh, I'll just show you just a few. This is the real, real kind of dull looking vireo, but it's got maybe the prettiest song. It's called the warbling vireo. And this one is a um, 
Hutton's Vireo. And this one, you can, this one is easy to confuse with the Ruby Crown Kingdom. They're both about the same size. This one is just a different, little bit different beak, and it's a lot slower moving. It's not nearly as um, energetic as the Ruby Crown. And this beautiful Vireo is Cassin's Vireo. How do you spell that? Uh, Cassin, he was an ornithologist, I'm some old white guy probably from England. C A S S I N apostrophe S, Cassin's Vireo. So the, there's a lot of Cassin's this and Cassin's that. Cassin's Kingbird, Cassin's Vireo. Just like Townsend's Warbler, they're all these um, mostly um, older white birders back in the day in the 1900s that named all these birds. There's actually a talk about changing these birds named by people to names that are more specific to the bird, which, you know, in some respects it might be a good idea and it'll drive birders absolutely nuts if they do it. But, you know, you might want to call this the uh, light yellow breasted vireo or something instead of Cassin's, you know, at least it says something about it. <clears throat> I'm sure you all know about cedar waxwings. They're migrants that come in in big flocks. They love uh, the toyon berries and the, um, a lot of any a lot of other berry fruits. They're real pretty birds. Got that interesting mask and crest. And you can see again, um, again they love my fountain. <clears throat> Huge group of birds called sparrows. Uh, when you start out birding, sparrows basically are all just called LBJ, little brown jobs. They're pretty. They can be difficult to, to distinguish sometimes. Um, the beauty of photography is you can take a picture, go home and spend your time with the books and stuff to figure out what you've seen if you if you want. And that, it, it's very helpful. So this one is a very invasive bird that doesn't belong here, but it's been here forever. Um, the house sparrow, it comes from England and Europe. They started on the East Coast and moved their way West like many invasives that came from Europe. Um, if you want to find a house sparrow, go to McDonald's, buy a hamburger, sit outside and they'll be under the table. That's uh, how sparrows have learned to live with humans, that's given their name. And they live with humans very well. They, they pick up the scraps on the, under the floor and all that stuff. Um, they're also kind of hard on our Western bluebirds. They tend to rob their nests, take over their nests. But our native sparrows are very cool. This one is a song sparrow singing away. They have a really beautiful song. This one's similar to a song sparrow. It's called Lincoln's Sparrow. Uh, I don't think that's Abe. I think it's another ornithologist. They're, um, these are more so, uh, uh, stealthy. They don't come out as quite as much. That's Lincoln's. Very common right now. This is a harbinger of, of fall and winter are the white crowned sparrows. And that's a male on the top and a female on the bottom. I'm sure you all know about sexual dimorphism, especially in birds where the males typically are much prettier or much more colorful or marked than the females. And obviously the reason we think is the females have to sit on the eggs. And the last thing a female on eggs wants to do is advertise her presence. And so uh, she wants to blend. Whereas the male needs to show off his beautiful colors and stuff to attract the mate. So that's a white crowned sparrow. This is a lesser common one, but still possible, the golden crowned sparrow. You can see why it's called that. A little bit bigger than the white crown. And often they'll be with a flock of white crowns on the ground. This one is typically in, in brush like this. It's called Savannah's Sparrow. It's got the main field mark on this one. If you see that yellowish supercilium, yellowish streak over the eye, and it's a real streaky brown bird in the grass, that's a Savannah Sparrow. Another sparrow-like bird, uh, I've got them in my yard this morning, are these dark-eyed juncos. There's a a number of different juncos. This one is the Oregon junco, dark-eyed junco. They all have a black head for the most part. Big sparrow. This is our one of our biggest sparrows. It's the California tohi. Not a particularly colorful bird except for his uh, <clears throat> rump or butt. Um, it's uh, a common name for it is an orange butt. So if you see a big brown sparrow with long tail and an orange butt, that's our California tohi. It's here year-round, very common bird. The other towhee we have is a much more beautiful bird, a spotted towhee. And it's, um, they have a few months where I don't see them and then they come back. Much more beautiful bird, spotted towhee. We do have bluebirds. Uh, this is the Western bluebird. The male has this reddish 
breast and incredible blue body. And the female on the right, as you can see, hints of blue in the tail and little hints of blue on the back. That's the female Western bluebird and the one on the left is its chick. The other group of little brown jobs are the finches. And so all of these birds with these big heavy beaks are basically seed eaters and they have to crunch those seeds. This is the really common finch it's called the house finch, the male on the lower left and the female there. And the males can pick up red, yellow or orange on their heads and throats and lumps based on apparently the colors of the foods that they're eating. Most of the kind, this is the, probably the most typical color though, um, the house finch. Here's a female house finch feeding a chick in Alta Vicente in the prickly pear. So the female and the chicks all look the same because they don't want to show off their colors too much. Real common little finch called the lesser goldfinch. And this is the male on the right and the female on the left. They can be really variable in their coloration. So you have to go mostly by size and how they act after a while because uh, you can see they can be almost virtually all gray. Some of them can be almost all black and white. Uh, this is, I think, the classic for both of them, the classic look for both of them, lesser goldfinch. And if, if you're out birding and you get to see one of these guys, it's considered a good day. This is lazuli bunting, another seed-eating bird you can tell by its beak. And if, if you don't think that's a pretty bird, then you don't want to be a birder. And I think it's, it's a really gorgeous little bird. Then a bigger seed-eating bird is the gross beak. It's got the gross beak, the big beak. And this is the one that we see the most often in Palos Verdes. It's the black-headed ghost beak. This is what the youngster looks like, the baby black-headed ghost beak. We also have tanagers. Uh, our tanager in Palos Verdes is the Western tanager. The bird on the left is the male. The one on the right is the female. Uh, the ornithologist at the Natural History Museum told me that uh, tanagers actually are cardinals which is kind of interesting. Um, they're doing, now they're, another thing is everything is DNA stuff. And when they do the DNA, they find out that what we call tanagers is really kind of a variation of a cardinal. The, one of the types of birds most uh, coveted by a lot of birders are the warblers. This one is the aptly named yellow rump warbler. And it's one of the most common warblers we're gonna see when they're here. Um, when they're here, we might, you might see 20 or 30 of them uh, in the grass looking for insects or up in the trees. Yellow rump warbler. Townsend's warbler. So warblers typically have yellow, black, and white in, in various combinations. And so the, the birders that try to ID them have to become expert in these various subtle differences in where the yellow is, where's the black, and where's the white. This one's Townsend's. Here's another black, yellow, white, and greenish. It's the common yellow throat. This one is year round, maybe the most common warbler of the Palos Verdes. It's the orange crowned warbler. It usually just looks kind of like yellow green, not a lot of color. Uh, you can see a hint there of the orange crown that they have that they'll flash kind of like the ruby crown kinglet when they feel it's important. Uh, usually you don't get to see that. Orange crowned warbler. This little guy with the black skull cap and the beady black eye is Wilson's warbler. And again, I, I'm hoping you're appreciating the fact that we have this little island in Palos Verdes. It's a very small island. And we have amazing numbers of warblers. You know, We're, we have an incredible uh, variety here, uh, which is a testament to our great biodiversity. This beautiful one is the yellow warbler. The males have the yellow, excuse me, the red streaks on their breasts. And now this guy is a, an outlier as far as the way the colors go. He is yellow, white, and black, and gray, but the only yellow on him is that little headlight in front of his eyes, which is the distinguishing characteristic for this guy. And he is named correctly, this is the black-throated gray warbler. So you can't do it any better than that, black-throated gray warbler. A lot of people see this one, and they think they're seeing this one, which is the black and white warbler. This is one that doesn't have any yellow. You can see it's a much different looking bird. It's a little bit bigger. It also acts more like a woodpecker or a nuthatch and will walk up and down the trunks of trees looking for insects. 
so um, this is black and white, much less common. It's always exciting to see these guys. Um, it's fun to see these guys because they're not that common, but this one's much more common than the black and white. Randy? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. The beaks are different. They are different. Yeah, that's and that's uh, that's an interesting point. The the black and white has to pr probe, probe into the bark of these trees to get insects. So it's not pounding like a woodpecker would, but it's, it needs these long forceps to get in to get these little caterpillars and stuff. Whereas this guy um, is just getting insects off the branches and the leaves. So yeah, the, the, all of these insect eating birds have variations on a sharply pointed beak. Uh, but you're right, that's got a different, it's a totally different looking bird. If you see the two of them together, they don't look anything alike. But when people, you know, a lot of times you see a bird for, you know, 15 seconds, if you're working with binoculars, oh, I think I saw a black and white warbler, you know. If you get a photo and you see this uh, yellow headlight, you know, that it's, it's the black sort of gray. And then this was a treat for me in my yard because I've only seen this bird about four times in my whole life. It's called the hermit warbler all yellow head so it's the yellow black and white thing again in this case he's got an all yellow head with a black throat another group of birds are the thrushes and this is the one we have in palos verdes is the hermit thrush they eat worms and insects like that we have a we have our we have a hermit thrush in our yard we've had for the last two months they're here in the winter and this is the other very famous thrush the american robin both of them uh, seen here in Palos Verdes. One of the more gaudily colored beautiful birds are the Orioles. And the one that we see the most in TV is the hooded Oriole. This is the male hooded. And this is the female hooded Oriole. And this is uh, not as often seen and always fun as Bullock's Oriole. If you want to attract an Oriole to your yard, go get some Welch's grape jelly put it in a little cup and hang it from a tree, uh, hang it so the ants can't get to it if you can, and, and that the squirrels can't get to it if you can. And during when they're here, you will get hooded Orioles. If they find your great, uh, Welch's grape jelly, you're gonna have to buy it by the case. They <laughs> eat us out of house and home, but they love grape jelly. Yeah. Okay, pigeons and doves, very common stuff we know about, but these are our morning doves. And um, the morning doves, if you'll notice, they've got this white, uh, little pretty blue ring around their eye. They've got a little white, a little black spot on their neck. But the and a main thing is they've got this long, capered, sharp tail. So and they're the ones you see the most. But you might see this guy and go, oh, that's a morning dove. But if you look closer, no blue ring around the eye. Instead, it's got a bright red eye. It's got this black color around the back of its neck. And look at its tail. It's wide and cut off. It's not a tapered pointed tail. So this, this is an invasive dove called the Eurasian collared dove. They are becoming very well adapted here. I'm not sure if they're pushing out morning doves, but they're certainly competing for food with them. Eurasian collared dove. <clears throat> we have woodpeckers in Palos Verdes. The smallest one, one of the smallest in North America is this guy, the downy woodpecker. And then we have big woodpeckers, and this was taken in Portuguese Bend. It's the uh, red shafted, northern red shafted flicker, uh, male on the right and the female up there on the left. And this is a good look at a northern red shafted. You can see why they call it a red shafted flicker. Actually, a, quite a beautiful bird. It's one of the largest woodpeckers. If you're heading towards the beach, there's a whole different kind of bird out there in the, uh, utilizing the beaches in the water. Before we go to birds though, let's go back to go to mammals for a second because if you're on the beach, you might see a California sea lion pup heading for the water. Uh, and I know you guys know this stuff and, and uh, we got harbor seals. These are one of my favorite seals. When I scuba dive at Catalina and Anacapa and stuff, often these harbor seals will, if you're real mellow, they'll come up to you. And I've had a harbor seal climb on my back and hang on and put his head on my head. <laughs> if you can believe that. And I've seen him come up and, and put their flippers around some a diver's leg and look up at him with his big puppy dog eyes. I love harbor seals, they're very cool. Um, and then of course we've got our dolphins, bottlenose dolphins and common dolphin. 
And if you're lucky, once in a while, you might get to see a humpback whale, which is pretty cool. I'd like to say that I have a California gray whale photo, but I don't, so I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> um, but we do, as you guys know, we get all kinds of whales right off the beach, if you pay attention, right? But if you're looking off the beach and you look outside the surf, you might see a bunch of weird looking ducks that are all black. It could be a raft of 50 of them. These are surf scoters. They got a really weird bill, white forehead. We've got uh, uh, these terns, Western, and, excuse me, um, grebes. Uh, and so we have two kinds of grebes here. One of them is the Western grebe and one is Clark's grebe. The Western grebe, I can tell it by the fact that the eye is covered by black. And the way I remember it is that the, in the West, the sun goes down. And in the Western grebe, the, the, the black goes down over the eye. Whereas the Clark's grebe, which is the one on the right, the eye is in white. Unfortunately, uh, there are Western Clark's grebes hybrids, and then it gets all mixed up. But it, the thing is, they're an elegant grebe that we do see out here quite a bit. We do see double crested cormorants. And if you see the white feathers on that one in the middle, that's a male that's in breeding plumage. That's where the double crested comes from. You don't really see that very often, but these, uh, these are the big black cormorants that are seen flying uh, over the water. They're big fishermen. I've, I've photographed cormorants 70 feet, under, uh, 70 feet deep under an oil rig. Um, they're quite efficient fisher birds, double crested cormorant. Then we have the little peeps and there's all kinds of little peeps, but the, this one is the pretty common Western sandpiper and the least sandpiper. Western's got the black legs. That's one way to tell. And where'd my arrow go? The least has the yellow legs. We have a spotted sandpiper. It's spotted when it's up north breeding. This is what it looks like when it's here. We have the wimbrel, which is a larger sandpiper that's got that decurve, fairly long decurve bill. Wimbrel. And then the one that's got the ridiculously long decurve bill is the long billed curlew. We've got some more sandpipers on the left, very common, all gray, medium size, gray legs. That's the willet. On the right, we have a larger one that's got a marbling look to its feathers and its bill is long and going up to God. So it's the marbled godwit. That's how I remember that one. Marbled godwit and a willet. If you look at uh, Royal Palms, maybe is a good place. I go to Royal Palms, look in the, along the rocks, you might see this guy. It's hard to miss once you've seen that big oyster breaking bill. This is a black oyster catcher. Occasionally we get lucky with the American oyster catcher, which um, usually is in South America. And uh, we'll occasionally get up this way. I think California, I think maybe Palos Verdes is its farthest Northern range. You know, it's American oyster catcher. We've got the turnstones that work in the kelp that's on the beach looking for insects. We've got plovers doing the same thing in the mud flats. This is black bellied plover. And our most common plover is the killdeer. It's got those two black uh, necklaces. That's our killdeer. It's a type of plover. Here's a killdeer being mess, uh, messed with by, by a red winged blackbird. You can see a good look at its feathers. We've got egrets like the snowy egret and the great egret. The difference between the two, the snowy is a lot smaller and he's got uh, those yellow feet, if you can see his feet. And the egret, much, great egret, much bigger, big bill and black feet. This is what a great egret looks like in flight. Probably the most common big wader that you guys seen are the great blue herons, which will eat just about anything they can eat. I've seen them eat gophers, snakes, and all kinds of stuff. Of course, we've got mallards. <clears throat> and we've got turns. It's a common turn. They're real elegant. They kind of look like a, a, a gull until you really look at them. They're much more elegant, uh, uh, finely tuned. This is Forster's turn. There's all kinds of turns, royal turn, Caspian turn, um, all similar. They're fish eaters that dive into the water with those fish piercing bills. And of course, we've got our California brown pelican. <clears throat> Love, it's cool watching the pelicans dive into a bait ball. 
this is, uh, I think it have one code. And then wonderful goals. Everybody loves goals, unless you have a boat. <laughs> but uh, this is our Western goal. It's got those pink legs, big, big white and gray goal with pink legs. That's Western. Unfortunately, goals have sometimes two, three, or four different color patterns based on their age. Uh, and, they, and the youngsters usually are much more colored like this. Um, this one is similar to the Western, but it's smaller and it's got yellowish greenish legs. That's our California goal that, that uh, really needs Mono Lake, Salt and Sea, Mono Lake, and the Great Salt Lake to survive. Then we have the ring build goal. It's got that black ring around its bill. Herman's goal. This is one of the easier ones to ID. It's got a bright red bill and it's pretty much all dark except for the white head. Herman's goal. You all know this guy, a northern mockingbird that can mimic many different kinds of birds. This one's sort of a similar bird, but not seen nearly often as often as the loggerhead shrike. And then we have our jays. A lot of people say, I have a blue jay in my yard. And they do. It's blue and it's a jay, but its actual name is the California scrub jay. The actual blue jays are eastern birds. And we have our red winged blackbirds. This is the female. Obviously, that's the male with his brightly colored shoulder, and then the female. I saw this bird at um, uh, the uh, Ken Malloy Park. This is a red winged blackbird that's got a um, coloration called Lucis Lucism, which means white. Uh, it's got an unusual coloring. We've got ravens and crows, the common raven, big, heavy bill, diamond shaped tail. Crows, a little more refined bill and a more of a squared off or fan shaped tail. Um, an, another topic for a whole hour would be talking about how intelligent these two birds are. They're incredibly intelligent. Get into owls. This is the great horned owl, the one we see most commonly. And uh, occasionally you get really lucky when you're out birding in the middle of the day, you have a great horned owl sitting out in the middle of the day on a perch like that. It's not too common. Really beautiful bird. They're quite um, quite a predator. You don't want to leave your cat out at night uh, because they've been known to take skunks. So they definitely could take a cat. They're a, quite a, they, they push out the barn owls. Here's a, um, some owlets, great horned owlets. And here's the barn owls appropriately found in a barn. They are here. I don't see them nearly as often as the great horned owls. There used to be burrowing owls. I think there's occasionally one being seen. Somebody reported one in Alta Vicente. They used to be here a lot, but they do nest in the ground. And so with humans and dogs and cats and all that stuff, they're pretty much getting wiped out. We're hoping to provide habitat for them. And we ask, that's why we ask people to keep their dogs leashed when they're on the trail, because uh, if we're going to get any nesting birds on the ground, the, the dogs off, off leash are making it difficult for them. So it's one of my favorite little owls is the burrowing owl. And then we have our raptors. This is the uh, kestrel, American kestrel. They eat insects and little frogs. They're really beautiful little birds. I used to call this a sparrow hawk when I was a kid. Everybody called them sparrow hawks. A little bit bigger hawk is the merlin, uh, also known as the lady hawk in the Middle Ages. When the royals went falconing, the women got the merlin, it's a little hawk, the men got a bigger hawk. Um, a real pretty little bird. We don't see these quite as often. This is a sharp shinned hawk, which is easily confused with the Cooper's hawk. Um, and this, I'm assuming, is a sharp shinned hawk. It's very difficult sometimes. Supposedly, it's a much bigger eye and a squared off tail, because this is the Cooper's hawk. And you can see how similar these two birds are. The male Cooper's hawk, and this is a good demo of what Cooper's hawks do, they eat birds. This is a Cooper's hawk youngster. Young Cooper's hawks don't have all that coloring. They're streaky like a lot of other youngsters. Our famous peregrine, which you guys know all about, I'm sure, um, that roost on the cliffs right down below the White House. Here's our peregrines. Here's the peregrines feeding the babies. Maybe the fastest animal in the world when they're on a dive over 200 miles an hour. Pretty incredible. 
A bigger hawk that is here in PV quite a bit is the red-shouldered hawk. They're really beautiful. Here's a pair. They, they're overhead calling, you know, crying out real loud a lot. And uh, they could be confused with the red-tailed hawks. Here's the red-tailed hawk, our real big hawk, um, the most common hawk in North America. And again, they've been known to take birds as well. The main way to look at, figure out a hawk that all the red tail, this is a red tail and it doesn't have a red tail, is if you see these dark, uh, really dark bands on its shoulders, on the underwings, if you see that, those right there, that's generally our red tailed hawk. And of course, if you see them overhead with the red tail, it's easy to ID them. They're the, they're the big brown hawk cir circling overhead a lot. We have fish eating hawks like the osprey. I got this picture right below the, right by the lighthouse. It's a mullet, I think. And then the other day I looked up, I heard a raven harassing what I thought was a red tailed hawk until I looked up and had my camera handy and I shot this picture as it flew overhead and they got it ID'd and it turned out to be a very rare hawk called a broad winged hawk. And so uh, here's a shot of a broad winged hawk at the Botanic Garden. And this is a shot of the broad, the same individual bird. It's one bird that's been at the garden and now in my yard. This is in my yard um, for the last maybe a month. It's supposed to be up in Ontario, in northern Canada. And it's a, one individual that's down here. It's considered a, a rare casual migrant. So I was pretty, this is pretty exciting for birders. Broad winged hawk. Another very cool hawk is the northern harrier. They're almost like an owl. They've got these. Uh, forward protruding eyes and we have a white patch on their rump and they're a large big large hawk that we see occasionally a good place to see them is at, Ch at uh, white point this is a picture of a peregrine falcon uh, with a uh, below and the northern harrier above the peregrine had dived on the northern harrier uh, kind of harassing them we also have kites it's a white-tailed kite really beautiful little raptor this is the, the, uh, the youngster. They eat dragonflies. They'll go up, I, I'm here, up to a thousand feet in the air to get dragonflies. Then we have invasive birds like the European starling. They usually look black, but the males can be really colorful like this. And this is another invasive dove that is starting to take off like the Eurasian collar dove. And this one, um, this is the spotted dove, it's from Asia. We have parakeets coming up from Mexico and Central America. This is the mitered parakeet. There's a bunch of them, of different ones. And this yellow chevron, chevron parakeet. Um, these are real noisy birds. They'll be a flock of a dozen or so. They love coral trees. If you want to see parakeets, the yellow chevron, go to find the coral trees. And in from Africa, now we're getting finches from Africa, probably from the pet trade. This is called a pintailed whita. Uh, the males have this ridiculously long tail, obviously, but you can see it's got that finch beak. This is the female. Uh, the main way to tell them is that bright red beak. We also have an invasive bird that's now well established is, is a scaly breasted munia. It's another kind of a finch like bird from Indo Pacific. Here's the male on the top, the females on the bottom. They're all over now. This one's starting to happen also, another invasive, it's a bronze mannequin. <clears throat> and this one is from Africa, it's the red or orange bishop. All of these are invasives that probably came from people having a pet that got out or something like that. And they're all finding it very easy to survive here in Palos Verdes. This is the female bishop. We also have this really, really, really huge, gaudy, unbelievable bird here that's an invasive bird that was introduced, as you know, back in the early 1900s. Here's a mom with the chicks. At one point, we were fortunate or unfortunate to have 16 peafowl living in our yard and reproducing in our yard. It's kind of a yin yang thing. Here she is showing her babies how to eat. And I'm moving now quickly to our mammals. So this is a Cooper's hawk and a fox squirrel trying to figure out who's gonna be boss. Fox squirrels usually win. They're another invasive that is pushing out our native, nature, our, our native tree squirrels. 
Uh, it's the Eastern Fox Squirrel. This is our native ground squirrel, California ground squirrel, also pretty dang destructive. Um, they make huge warrens of tunnels uh, where they wipe out your property. <laughs> we also have an invasive Norway rat. We have a native Bothus pocket gopher. And we have desert or Audubon's cottontail. We have raccoons, as you know. Virginia opossums, which is our only native marsupial. We have striped skunks. We have the pre apex predator in PV is the coyote. This is not my photo. I took this off of YouTube or whatever. Um, next door, I think I took it off the of next door. It's a red fox. It was introduced by people thinking it would be a good idea to hunt them just like they do in England. And now they're somewhat doing well, pretty well. They're doing a lot better than our native California gray fox. This is actually not a California gray fox. It's a Santa Island, excuse me, Santa Cruz Island gray fox. But this is exactly what the California grays look like. They are so in, rare. I have yet to see one in the wild down here. But you can go to Santa Cruz Island and see these guys all over the place because they've done a big eradication effort to get rid of its um, predators like the golden eagle, for instance, goats, cats, things like that. And now they're thriving in Santa Cruz Island. Palos Verdes Peninsula, as you all know, is creating habitat for all of these wonderful animals. And we appreciate you getting out on the trails and enjoying all this wonderful biodiversity. And that's, that's it. Thanks, folks. Anybody still there? <laughs> <laughs> I Thank thoroughly you. enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Randy. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I think you overwhelmed them, Randy. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> Need to see it about five times. Probably. Well, I know it's a lot. It's a lot of information. <laughs> a lot. That's why I was I was saying that just just you look at it as an appreciation of all the variety of life that we have here. That's that's the that's the message. Although I am sending all of you a, a, a test and you'll have to fill out the test. <laughs> Everybody, you need to ask Randy about his camera. How did he get such gorgeous pictures? Exactly. <laughs> How did I get such gorgeous pictures? Oh, um, well, I've been taking a lot of pictures for a long time. Uh, I, learned, I learned about f-stops and shutter speeds a while ago. So um, a lot of it is just doing it. You got to get out and do it. And um, and I love it, and so uh, it's easy, it's fun to do. I kind of live with my binoculars and camera whenever I'm outdoors. But uh, happy to answer questions about photography if you have them. Randy, have them. Uh, yeah. Randy, do you have a uh, tripod and a camera trained on your fountain all the time? That's a very good question. I, uh, for about five years, I thought it was important for me to photograph every bird that I saw in my yard <laughs> and uh, Unfortunately, my my uh, the number of bird, uh, photos in my catalog kind of went out of off, off the charts, you know. But um, occasionally, I'll I have occasionally sat with my tripod. I use a tripod about two percent of the time. Almost everything is handheld. But once in a while, I'll set up and read a book or read the paper, have a cup of coffee, and have it aimed at the fountain, um, especially during the migration. And uh, if stuff starts happening, I'll, I'll do that occasionally. But uh, I'm mostly I'm mostly handheld. Any well, other questions? I'm really impressed with the clarity of your photos and, and uh, how you're able to uh, isolate a, a bird in its own habitat. And obviously, you only got about four or five seconds to be able to zero in on them and, and get them right and get the focus right. You're right. There's a lot of you know a lot of wildlife photography. See, I started off underwater photography. So for about 30 years, all I did was underwater photography. And I considered anything above water to be passe, you know. <laughs> and uh, underwater photography is pretty challenging. Um, and so, and that was before auto. There was no auto and stuff, you know. So it was all manual underwater. Um, and so the, the uh, basic skills developed that way. But the main th and the thing I learned underwater, is, for instance, you want to take a picture of a hammerhead shark, you need to know what a hammerhead shark does and what it doesn't like and all this stuff and uh, and so 
you can't get a picture of a hammerhead shark if you are wildly way throwing your arms around and exhaling a lot of bubbles. You have to literally sit down and hold your breath and hope that they come into you and you want to get next to a, a feeding station where a little fish will come and they'll, the shark will show up and they'll eat parasites off them. So you find a feeding station and you hold your breath and then the shark comes. That's how you get a hammerhead. Same thing with birds. You have to learn about birds. So if I'm looking at a hawk and I want to get that pit, like that picture of the broad wing hawk flying, that's a, for me, I love, I like that photo. Um, that's not an easy photo to get. You have like a second, uh, but I had already thought, okay, he's going to leave here soon. So I stood there for a while. I set up my camera for uh, a bird in flight as far as shutter speed and stuff. And I waited for him to act like he was ruffling his feathers or maybe if, It'll take his tail feather and stick it up high. Sometimes they poop right before they fly. When I see that activity, then I then I focus on him and, mm -hmm. and a little bit ahead of him, and then he takes off. So a lot of it is learning the animal and their animal's habits really helps. And then a lot Randy, of it is just luck. <laughs> Randy, you have a question. Yeah, if, good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Can you recommend binoculars the size yes. for bird watching? That's from Sam Wilson. Sure. Um, Eight by 42s, eight by 42s are usually a good start because the, the uh, so the, the bigger that first number is, the more telephoto it is. And just like, tele, like a telescope, if you look through a telescope at, um, that's not in a tripod, you can't see anything. It's, everything is all over the place. Uh, you look at stars with binoculars, so everything, you know, rattles. So, um, Eight by 42 is a good start. After you've grown out of them, I use 10 by 42s. But at first to find stuff, it's easier to find stuff with eight by 42s. You just can't find them as far away or quite as clearly. And then of course, the quality of the lenses is very important. So a very good way to find out about binoculars is to go to Bob Shanman's Wild Birds Unlimited on uh, PCH at uh, Prospect. And they sell binoculars, but they'll also tell you a lot about all the different options. And uh, the good store to, it's a good store to, uh, you know, spend your money in anyway. And there's good stuff, bird ID books are there, all that kind of stuff, as well as bird seed, of course. Anybody else have any questions? Pipe up. Randy, yes. when you've done your underwater stuff, do you snorkel or scuba or free dive? Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> for 99% of it, it's, it's scuba because uh, you, so you have to, you know, be still and <laughs> be there for a while, you know. Um, but uh, the one, the couple of times I've snorkeled is with, and you guys should like this, I guess. I snorkeled with um, humpback whales. Wow. And um, yeah, in the Caribbean, that was life-changing experience. And uh, you, you can't, they don't allow you to dive for one thing. And then it's strictly a snorkel. And uh, that was pretty phenomenal <laughs> to say the least and it's, uh and then uh the other is with whale sharks um at uh, like i was mentioning uh, off of cancun there's an island called isla mujeres and the, about an hour by boat ride from isla mujeres is an area where in a certain time of year these little tunny these little type of tuna um you know put out their row and all the whale sharks come in to eat the the eggs and uh, the water is actually pretty clear. And so for whale sharks, um, you're snorkeling because they're on the surface too. And there's no reason to go deep. So there are times when snorkeling is good, but it's very difficult to take a good photo while snorkeling, unless you've got the lungs of a, of a double-crested cormorant or something. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I invited people to go to my website if you're interested. It's um, www.rkh-photography.com. Can you say that again? Yeah, it's uh, rkh-photography.com. There's, there's underwater um, uh, destination and land photography. It's all about wildlife. Thank you. Yep.